This episode of Lord John Lander includes sensitive topics that some listeners may find distressing or triggering. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Lord John Lander, the Outlander podcast for Lord John fans, where we talk about all things Outlander, but especially about Jamie and his Sassanac. And sometimes we talk about Claire, too. For however long it takes, we'll lead you on a journey so chaotic, you'll question every life choice that led you to be here today. And like the Hotel California, you can check out any time, but you can never leave. We may not be the Outlander podcast you wanted, but we will be the Outlander podcast you didn't know you needed. Now, before we get into it, this is your one and only warning that show and book spoilers are lurking around every corner. We're going to spoil stuff from future seasons, future books, and our own brains. Remember, if you can't prove our headcanon didn't happen, then we can only assume that it did. If you make it through the episode in one piece, we'd love to hear from you. Send us your burning questions, wild theories, thick prompts, flattering compliments, or whatever's on your mind. You can contact us on Twitter and Tumblr at Lord John Lander or on our website at lordjohnlander.wordpress.com where you'll also find our archived episodes, teasers, thick wrecks, and more. Hello, welcome to Lord John Lander. We are your hosts. I am Mistress Pandora. You can call me Pan. My co-host is here, of course. Hello, it's Beth. And again, we are joined by Ness, Geek in the Pink or Geek in the Fuchsia Hair. Ness, so good to have you again. Thanks for having me. Gonna have some fun. Gonna try really hard to keep this one under two hours. <laughs> this is you the first so- time. Oh, sorry. This is the first time where I think we'll be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's You have such wonderful faith. Um <laughs> I, you know, it just thought, dawned on me. It It's so funny the way your nickname is Ness. And then, like, there's the whole thing in the Lord John books where... Oh, yeah. <laughs> the girls... The, the, the whore's name is Nessie. Nessie! And I'm so blessed. <laughs> and he can, all he can think of is, like, the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. And, like, yeah. That's, that nickname and, has haunted me, like, actually since <laughs> I was a child. Because my family always called me Ness. It was my nickname. But my best friend's um, parents called me Nessie because of the Loch Ness Monster and as a child it was like humiliating so what I yeah the door drawn question there is pretty hilarious okay. so now I now I don't care but as a child it was very it wasn't something that I liked <laughs> I don't okay, think he wants to be called a monster but you know okay but Nessie is awesome she's an amazing character well yeah there you go yes. so. she's oh, yeah. she's frankly she's a badass shit. and hilarious yes and hilarious yeah there you go and she married Rab McNabb <laughs> right Oh, that's fun. Yeah, oh, you there. didn't know that? No. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she one. married Robbie McNabb and moved up in the world. She's a madam now. She's not oh, that's just a working gal. Well. Yeah, oh, she's yeah. a business owner. Oh, love it. Love to hear it. And she loves when John brings her sweets. Oh. So anytime he goes to visit her, because um, a lot of times he'll go to her for like, um, you know, does she have any info on something that he's looking into or can she get some? Because of course she kind of knows oh, everybody oh, and, love it. you know, um, so he'll come in and bring her sweets and then cut to kind of butter her up. And then, um, you know, then they talk business. Excellent use of the name. I'll, I'll thank DG for one thing and one thing alone. <laughs> and, there, and that's it. It's that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, real quick, we have a correction clarification from last week. Um, I think Beth, did you do the, you must've done the research on this because I didn't do any research this week. I did. So, um, last week we were talking about Mercy Woodcock being, uh, cast for season seven and I couldn't quite remember which of Hal's sons was in a relationship with her, but it was. Henry. So that's Hal and Minnie's third born son. And he gets injured and he gets taken to uh, stay with her. And remember, she's a free black woman um, and she takes care of him. And then actually Denzel comes and operates on him. And then Claire does another operation on him. So he's kind of a big character in uh, uh, written in my own heart's blood. And Mercy is married 
but her husband is a continental soldier and it's pretty heavily implied in written in my own heart's blood that he dies in battle, but they don't actually confirm it. But anyway, she nurses Henry back to health and they get the whole Florence Nightingale thing going on and, uh, and they're, they have a relationship. So. There we go. It so I don't know nice. what she's going to do if, Hen- if Henry Gray isn't there and Henry Gray is like the vehicle by which Claire meets Denzel, if I recall correctly. Oh, so maybe it remember. does start an echo in the bone. Um, oh, yeah, it must. It must start an echo in the bone. But anyway, um, yeah. So I, I really am holding out hope that we're going to get the Grays in season seven because a lot of this shit just doesn't make sense if we don't have them. And and then I'm going to be like wildly disappointed. But Yeah, no, we need, they're the best part of it. <laughs> Can you best. imagine the win, though, of getting Willie and the Greys in season seven? Oh, oh, oh. Definitely a, a contender for one of the best seasons, for sure, if that happens. Most I'm, just ho- I'm just holding out hope that they're going to announce the Greys, like, all at once. Or it- they're going to shift some of the storyline into what hopefully is a season eight. Mm-hmm. Or a Anyhow. spinoff. Oh, I'm yes. not. I'm not holding my breath, but I'm no, hopeful. no. You never know. So this week we are talking episode two hundred five, untimely resurrection, which I happened to be looking at the wiki page for the episode, and that is the chapter twenty one title of Dragonfly oh. and Amber. For those following along at home, <laughs> I don't know if that's a related fucking chapter, but there we go. Yeah, it probably is. I would imagine so. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what else, like what else in the series, like relates to that, and it seems to be the only because it's such a shock, right? When you, yeah, when you see him. But also, is it though? Is it? Is it? We know he's freaking alive. We're talking about Blackjack, by the way. Blackjack Randall. Is it? Was it good storytelling to spoil that? Like, I'm not sure. Is like, I mean, you are surprised to see him in France because he's not supposed to be there but uh or like you don't yeah you don't expect him to be there but it's almost like i wonder if it would have been better but then you couldn't have introduced um alex randall and stuff and you you probably needed some of that to build up so poor alex randall like he exists to like just be like a vehicle he's it's he's constantly in some sort of pain and he's just like a vehicle to like <laughs> you know to get the element of like the slow, you know, first he, she finds out that uh, Blackjack is alive and then he, because he gets arrested at their party, that is what brings Blackjack to mm-hmm. France. So it's like poor Alex, he is just, oh my Dragons God, the poor boy. Gutter, yeah. the poor boy. He poor is thing. just, and he's the sweetest, but he's like the band aid for a plot hole. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. just to skip around because that's what we do. I, I, I'm. This had never occurred to me before, but I wonder if the duel between Jamie and Jack Randall was written first. Oh, and 100%. then, oh shit! How is he supposed to? Oh shit! I got to go back and like give him a right. brother that can also, you know, have sperm, and that's. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. Oh, I think I think so many of her convoluted plot points are specifically designed because of that. Because she writes a scene that she's like, ooh, I really want to write this scene of them dueling. And then she's like, okay, now how do I get them there? Well, and I think, too, it's like, oh, I need to get Blackjack Randall to France because there's this great conflict, which is true. Is a great, It's true that it is a great conflict of there's no dueling is outlawed in France. So it suddenly exactly. makes it like, that is a good opportunity, but it's like, yeah, the stretch to get him there is a bit, especially cause he's injured. Like you're telling me he traveled and he was injured. Like it's a bit insane, but I mean, I know they, I, don't, I think it probably was more common than maybe uh, what would be acceptable for modern times. But uh, I, do, I don't think about it too much. Cause I like Alex Randall. And I think that's kind of, a, and he comes in as Sandringham's 
what is he uh secretary His secretary whatever. yeah whatever it is yeah so it, and it kind of makes sense and like sandring was everywhere so that kind of makes sense but uh yeah. but yeah but you're right it does seem to be like oh i want bjr to make this grand kind of shocking entrance and oh i want to do this duel yeah for sure and i want jamie to stab him in the dick yeah <laughs> God. Well, I was like, <laughs> fucking weird yeah <laughs> we'll get there we'll get there well, we gotta I'm save there. that one we gotta save that <laughs> and I just am like it seems like more and the more that I watch these first half of season two episodes it seems like more of this strange extra plot that has nothing to do with the overarching plot exactly. I guess you could I guess you could say it's le- kind of left over from season one or continuing from season one. But I just am like, oh, it's all about his lineage. And we're so, you know, we have to be so worried about Frank not being born. And like, like who's the main character here? Lady? I just, I don't, I don't. And then there's all these scene, random scenes. <laughs> and because I made the mistake of watching three episodes today, all of these random scenes in between that I get these episodes so confused because it's almost like they were shot in the same day. There's the, um, spoon <laughs> scene of Jamie and Claire and then I think in the episode the next episode there's the scene yeah when he tells her uh, that she has to make a promise to him that's they look exactly the same I bet you any money they shot that in sequence I bet you any money or very similarly because I'm like I thought those two scenes happened in the same episode they don't they happen in two like, I'm just and what are they whatever they're connecting moments and stuff for them whatever but like they make they just and they have nothing to do with the episodes. It just it's a it like the structure is is driving me a bit insane. Well, I think the the thing and we'll talk about this more next week, but I think like the thing with the spoons and her doubting her, you know, maternal yeah instincts and him making her promise is just a lot of it is just foreshadowing, right? Well, yeah, you know? exactly. Should we get into the foreshadowing? Should we get into it? Um, because I might as well. <laughs> the other bit of because I was surprised actually because I didn't remember this. How much foreshadowing um, for the rest of the season um, is kind of woven in? Because and this obviously makes sense. I think this this is the point. And this happened once again. Sorry, this happened over a few episodes. But like Master Raymond um, does the what is it? The sheep's knuckles and. Uh, tells her that she will see Frank again which is true which we know to be true if you've seen the series and Jamie um, obviously makes her promise and things like that and there is one oh my gosh wait pause all right I watched this episode yesterday while I was cooking dinner and I'm not gonna lie head empty just vampires so (laughs) what fucking promise I forgot already (laughs) When when Jamie makes her promise that if anything happens to him, he'll go. She'll go back. Which I'm very sorry oh, happens in the next. Okay, episode. it's not even this episode. Okay, see that's not fair. But once again, <laughs> because once again, it's because it it looks exactly the same. I think they're in the same room. They have the same hair. They they probably have different outfits, but they look generally the same as the spoon scene. It drives it drives me nuts. It was like gotcha. I was so confused. I was trying to make notes for this episode, and I was thinking like, "Oh, this is this episode." No, 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 that was the next episode. It, okay. it was a, it was a confusing thing for me, but right. um, I'm caught up now. It was a fatal mistake to watch three episodes in a row of this part of Outlander because we we talked about that a little bit last week too. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's really like I watched this episode. Like I watched these a few hours ago, and I was forgetting them. I was like forgetting the the on the, the statement of the first thirty minutes of this specific episode. I had not. There was nothing. I was like, I was watching. boring as shit. No, I, I could not tell you what happened. No, I'll. T- this is the only thing I know what happened because it bugged me. Claire tried to ruin and sabotage. Um, Mary and Alex's relationship uh, because of whatever lesser lesser of two evils in her mind. And I was just like, and I just had this thought of like, can you imagine a kind, normal person being like, oh yeah, this is justified. 
in ruining a relationship for this thing that I'm not even sure is going to happen will happen. Like, in, you're an insane person. You're an insane person to think that's okay. I just can't. I, and she didn't, but it drove me insane. She did them so dirty. I mean, I don't know how even the most, like, staunch Claire supporter could excuse this yes yeah i mean she just is it's so devious it's so dirty it's just she's literally first of all when when you know she tries to comfort mary and then she just decides you know what i'm just gonna burn this letter and let again poor alex randall because again he is just a vehicle to you know mess everybody's lives up and he did nothing fucking wrong and you know, there's this letter that could help get him out of jail. He's in the Bastille. He could rot there for the rest of his life for all Claire's knows. And she's fucking willing to let Frank's, one of Frank's relatives, even though she doesn't know that he's actually Frank's ancestor, she knows that he is a relative of Frank. And she's willing to let him rot in the Bastille to, to try to save Frank's life. I mean, and then her whole thing is like, well, Frank's innocent in all this. So is Alex fucking Randall. Yeah. Like, yeah. what the fuck? And guess who Frank's ancestor really is? Like, yeah. I just, I cannot. Like, can you imagine the close miss that really was? Because if she had succeeded, she actually... That would have been a nice little ironic twist. Yeah, who would have taught her a <laughs> you know? But, you know, I, I just, and then when she's talking to him, she's treating him like he is stupid. She is so patronizing sometimes. And I've mentioned it before. Like they, like mm-hmm. they were patronizing with Myrta earlier in the season. And then Double she's times. being patronizing. You know, oh, are, is that really what you want to subject Mary to? A life God. of being your nurse? Like, Claire, you are just, you don't give a fuck right now. You are just bulldozing over everybody. And you don't care who you're hurting just to save somebody who, theoretically, you don't even think you're ever going to go back to. I just... She's and it's so selfish this season. Yeah. It absolutely drives me in bonkers. In the weirdest way, in a way that it makes no sense. Like we say, she, she, he, and Jamie says this to her. Oh, sorry. This is probably, I think this is the next episode too. Jamie says to her, you chose me of your own will. I don't owe him anything. And yet she's making this her whole personality suddenly. Like yeah, I, like, yeah. It, it, and again, this has got to be, I feel like even this See, it's like every time it gets this contrived, that's when you're like, you know what? This is her trying to connect to randomly written points in the story. Mm -hmm. And why did it make it on the screen, though? (laughs) Fix uh, it. Stars, fix it. Because once you tangle it, how do you untangle it? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) then it becomes worse or or potentially worse. And I feel like... I was so mad. And I don't typically write out of order. I do occasionally if I've got a scene in my head that like I just can't get out of my head. I just got to write it down. Sometimes I never even end up using it because then when I go back and write in order, things might go in a different direction. Things Mm -hmm. might change. And I'm not going to write some convoluted bullshit to get to that scene, even if I love it. Because you know what? I love it. I wrote it. It's still a lovely piece of writing that I did that I wanted to do. Save it in the file and it could go move somewhere on. else. Yeah, maybe it's meant for something else. Right. And Mary, or just she, let it, just let it, be. let it go. Yeah, let it go. And the thing is, she calls Mary her friend. She says she's she's Ugh. you know takes her on as like a no. patient. She knows she's just been through this traumatic event. She's just. And I, she says this to her, and I think she does mean it, but it's like she just avoided this terrible marriage to this creep, or this or this potential creep, and she has this uh, future that could be better for her. And so what, so, oh, I just, so that just means nothing now? And I'm thinking, and the only justification I can think of for this is that she just feels so guilty about leaving Frank without explanation, which, but it's just not 
Like, it's not good enough. That's your own shit. Go to deal with some, get some therapy. Like, I just, it's not good enough. But, like, play out the logic, Claire. Yes. Mary is in love with Blackjack Randall's brother. How do you think she was going to completely ditch Alex and somehow get from right. A to B and still get from A to B to C after she's kicked B to the curb? Because they are completely like, opposite people, Jack and Alex. They're completely opposite. So, like, you're not going to just accidentally, oops, I slipped, and now I like I like the nasty guy. No. How would she even meet him? Yeah. That would have to be another big fucking coincidence. I'm saying fuck so many times. <laughs> so Whatever. So We're rated not safe for work. It's fine. And, like, stop making that shocked, appalled face when you say Alex Randall or you mention out. Al- like, it's not... Black Jack Randall, it's Alex Randall. They're two separate people. Like they're not, like this. I don't like this connection. I mean, whatever the family, but like I don't like this connection of oh, just because Mary says she's um, just because she makes the mistake of thinking that it's Black Jack Randall, but it turns out to be Alex. That she makes these like dramatic facial expressions whenever Mary talks to her about him. And I'm like, you're acting like you've met this person. He's clearly. Unless he's the best actor of all time, he's clearly not like that. Like, why? Why are you, con- like, why are you, yeah, conflating these things? It doesn't make sense. Well, in what kind of person would prefer to subject little Mary Hawkins to a marriage to Black Jack Randall over? Oh my God, that too. Maybe protecting her. Hus- her future husband that she's never planning to go back to from maybe not existing. Like what it, yeah. that doesn't make any sense. What kind of person, what kind of friend would do that? She know she fucking knows what black Jack Randall's like, because when, when they finally do get down to the marriage talk, you know, later on in the season, she, she fucking knows, mm-hmm. but like, why is she so fucking blind right now? And just so just, she's just got herself like boxed into this. I I don't even know. She's got that same tunnel vision from Rent and from different episodes in season one. I feel like she just picks this road and she's like, this is where I'm going. And she's so selfish, so yeah. self-centered throughout I all think of it's it. 20 times worse though than Rent. Yes. Because oh. it's not, because Rent was more, I mean, if you think oh, about Oh, for Rent, sure, for sure. Yeah, if you think about Rent, like, she had some justification for being, you know, like that. Like, she's pissy because she's been kidnapped. She doesn't want She doesn't want to be there. She has been basically kidnapped. She's basically being held prisoner. She wants to go home. Now, she doesn't even want to go, quote unquote, home. And she's still acting like this Uh like why would you steamroll over all the people that could be your potential friends for life Uh like she doesn't know that they're ever going to leave paris Mm -hmm. yeah that's true it sucks too because there's their characters two characters that are that wouldn't won't fight back on her right like they're so easily convinced by her kind of um assertive personality and stuff too so i think that's why it's like eliciting such a strong response from us she's bullying oh absolutely she is yes and I'm very proud of myself because I remembered the other foreshadowing. Okay. So um, the third one that I noticed was, I did say two, right? Please tell me I said two. Uh, the yes. third one I noticed was when she was talking to Louise about being pregnant. Oh, and she said, oh, I can't um, raise a baby without her, without his father. What do you, like, what's, mm. and Claire goes, oh, it doesn't matter if um, you raise the baby with a uh, biological father or not. It's all about if you raise a baby with love. And I was just like, oh my God, that feels like, that felt like so on the nose. And I d- obviously I don't. Well, no, I you wouldn't catch it. But I was the. Fr- I, was, I think this is the first time that I ever caught that, and I was like, "Oh wow, that's like, that's like yeah. direct season three things." That just makes me think of like, like Diana is obsessed with children not being raised <laughs> by their. <laughs> by their <laughs> she, she's obsessed with it. Think about all the characters in the Outlander series that are not raised. By at least one of their biological parents. It's insane. Oh my god. I don't know. I mean, I maybe I mean maybe she needs 
therapy. I don't know. Thera- <laughs> like- therapy, yes. <laughs> she got some parental issues. That I one. mean, that's a given. But that's so I, true. Yeah, it, she's obsessed with it. I mean, it works out well for us because we get Willie, and that makes up for everything yeah. for me. But it's it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's a lot of characters. I even forgot about Claire till I tried to go through the list. I was like, oh yeah, Claire too. Claire, yeah. Roger, Brianna had Claire, but also only one. Was... Yeah, Jamie had mostly just his father. Yep. Plus, plus one is um yeah. Plus he went to Dougal's. So oh, yeah. mm-hmm. well, his know. father died when he was youngish, like young enough. Yeah. Yeah, it was like nineteen or something. Marsley. Yeah, so. Marsley. Yeah. Oh, Fergus. Yeah. Fergus. Did you say yeah. Fergus? Yeah. Um. We eat. Roger. Re- we Roger. Ian's the one with his parents. It's about, I feel like he's the only one I can think of who was raised by his parents. Rabbi McNabb. Um, yeah. yeah, like Fergus and Marsley's kids and Roger, well, and even like Germain for a while was staying with uh, Granny and Grandpa. Mm-hmm. Um, Fanny. Fanny. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She was not raised by family. God. Like, uh, what's her face's kid? Amaranthus's baby right now is not being raised by his father. Yeah. John Cinnamon. John's father yeah. died, John. Oh, and so did um what's her face? What's uh oh, the cousin that married Malcolm Stubbs? Um Olivia. Olivia, right? Mm-hmm. Lost both her parents, right? Okay. Or no, is Malcolm no Malcolm's still alive, but the mother died. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but yeah, it's be, Percy, yeah, Percy? Olivia was raised by, well, Benedicta. Hal was technically her quote unquote guardian, but was raised by Benedicta. Percy, yep. It was, um, it was name a fucking right? character. Yeah. Yeah, name Yeah, we Ian. That's it. That's the only one I can think of genuinely. Yeah, well, and even he at like what, 14? Went, yeah, he went, went across the fucking ocean with his uncle. Yeah. Oh my God. It's crazy, right? Roger and Bree's kids. And Fergus and Marsley's kids are the only ones oh, wow. I can think of that grew up. Otherwise, with we don't know. Yeah, we just don't know the parental situation of the other ones. They're trying to stop the cycle. Yeah, uh, look true. at <laughs> look at Ian's son, uh, his other son. Oh my oh, god! I'm sure it's his son. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. And because that that's a whole thing because she was married to the one guy, and kind of made people think that the baby was that guy's kid and then he died right and then mm-hmm. she got married to this other guy who like rejected the kid and now he's actually going to be back with his biological father but not his mother <laughs> uh, yeah crazy can we just let kids have maybe less drama <sighs> dg and disney that'd be great <laughs> i think most i think most of uh, Jenny and Ian's other kids, you know, had their family intact. Someone so lived, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, they grew up and like you know went away. Some of them, but right. Um, well, yeah, but not too many of them, though. No, Michael, like Michael, that's about it. Yeah, he went to Paris, and then and then uh, Jenny, <laughs> it's like see a suckers. <laughs> <laughs> her kids were grown. She was good. Oh, I know. You know. Oh, anyway, wow, that was a that was a I did fun not tangent to go down that, but yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> Discovering new things is so fun. I would like to go back just very briefly. Well, I'm going to say briefly, and who fucking knows what's going to happen? But I would like to go back very briefly to Alex and Mary, and I would like, with y'all's permission, to just declare this a Alex Mary protection safe zone. Absolutely. Yes. That we love them, their cinnamon rolls, and we mm-hmm. are, that we must protect. <laughs> and we don't Which, have yes. a lot of those in Outlander, we, I feel like. We don't. <laughs> like not not in if you balance out the um uh R word people, like no, there's not enough. The what? The the rapists. Oh um, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, R word? <laughs> Watching too many YouTubers who are like trying not to get demonetized and stuff, that's what they say. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah, it, I'm just like you know, compared to like the evil characters, like there should be like quite a few cinema roles to balance out. There's know? like not there's there's not a lot, but we can Mary and Alex, we can declare them cinnamon rolls, and we love them, must protect them at all costs. Which means yeah. that um, Claire in this episode is enemy number one for me, but that's not unusual. 
if, if they're cinnamon rolls, what does that make Claire? Oh, God. Like salt or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, salt and savory, salty and savory, is, or savory and sweet is good. Have you ever bought a bag of potatoes and put it in your pantry and forgot about it for like oh, no. a month? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then eventually it turns into alcoholic potato soup. <laughs> and if you walk it past the pantry, you're like, why does it smell like ass? <laughs> What is that? It could. And then you find the bag of, of <laughs> liquidy potatoes. Yeah. That's and you accidentally put the cinnamon rolls next to those potatoes and the potatoes smell and <laughs> now you're somehow <laughs> ruin the cinnamon rolls. That makes sense. I like this. I like this. Or like one time <laughs> when I was a kid, I like opened I took a jug of orange juice out of the refrigerator and I didn't bother to look at the date and I was oh, like why no. is this fizzy oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh god um we can say that Fergus in this in this season is definitely a cinnamon roll oh yes, gosh we, we Fergus is a cinnamon roll he usually he, is he usually is I want to say yeah there's just well, like a moment recently sure. where the, yeah but yeah, but definitely this season. Yeah, um, I I always think that um, young Ian is a cinnamon roll for oh, me. Oh, absolutely. Like he's yeah. He must be protected at all costs. And John, honestly, is, of course, is John. my biggest it's cinnamon the biggest roll. One, yeah, he's like not even a cinnamon roll. He's like one of those. He's more big, complicated though. Big like monkey. He's like the monkey bread, right? Like <laughs> oh yeah. When you take the Pillsbury thing and then you. You chop it all up, and then you it gets it gets made into this like twisty, complicated deliciousness. Yeah, we're gonna have to post recipes with this fucking episode. I know. <laughs> and there's later ones like Liz, I think Lizzie is kind of like a cinnamon roll, and mm. like a, mm. a little. <laughs> why yeah, she, like, maybe she's too sassy, actually. But I'm like, like why? It. Why is it hard for me to think of cinnamon rolls now? See, this is what I mean, Stefan. Yeah, there's a go. list of our cinnamon Ongoing. rolls and add to it. Um, so I do have to make one. So we've talked a lot about how the Paris episodes can be a little tedious. They kind of blend together. And the plot at times is like, what's going on? This makes no sense, whatever. And it's interesting because people a lot of people i hear talking about paris the paris episodes as so you know oh they're so amazing like visually and i feel like they really relied heavily on like sets and costumes and yeah. all of that stuff to let in you know well i say yeah ward you know just wardrobe in general to like make up for sort of the weird stuff that's going on in the plot because one thing or, that or just, not going on in the plot yeah <laughs> because one thing that just like stood out for me in this episode is when they quickly con like flip over to versailles and like so much of paris is just like like it's dark in there mm -hmm. um in the house it's dark at the the uh brothel everything is dark but then you go to the versailles and it's just like popping with color it's like wizard of oz right when she lands in yeah. oz which again wizard of oz parallels with outlander uh -huh. um yeah. but yeah um so i just I, I really loved it yeah and it's so like everything about it is perfect just like the hedges and the you know mm -hmm. um and then everything falls to shit because black jack randolph shows up i have a controversial opinion. Love it. I like Black Jack Randall in this episode. I'm glad he's there. Yeah, I probably would agree. I'm glad he's there. Because I watched the first, and I'll, I'll never stop saying this, I watched the first 30 minutes, minutes of this episode and panicked because I chose to come on this episode of the podcast <laughs> thinking that this was a good idea and that I'd have stuff to say. And I spent 30 minutes not making notes on this episode and i was like what did i just do to myself especially having just listened to uh when you guys talked about episode 203 and maybe feel very validated the fact that you're like this is boring everybody's bored this is like boring 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 was the uh title and the um 
summary of that episode. Yeah. And then jarring shift to bright Versailles was like, and I was like, oh, thank God it does happen. Because that's what I thought I had chosen. And I was like, yeah, thank God. Like, thank God he's there and he has personality and he um, is, I guess it's funny because it's the first time where I don't, he, he where I just get the sense that he's actually not trying to stir shit up or not at his level anyway. Well, he he didn't didn't go there intending. Yes. Like he's super surprised to find out that Claire, to see Claire and find out that Jamie's there. Like he had no intentions, I think of, of running into them. Right. And he's obviously very, but he's very excited by the idea um, and wants to take advantage of that. I'm sure. But he, but I think what I like about it um, too, a lot is, uh, he just doesn't have he doesn't have a lot of power in in um, in France in Paris specifically, and I think which is obviously very um, obviously demonstrated by the fact that um, the king humiliates him in front of uh, in front of Jamie and Claire in the gardens <laughs> on purpose. We just love for to see it. Just for giggles, and sh- sh- and giggles. It's the best. It's a, that's like it's that's a top tier outlander scene. That's a great scene. And watching Sam like <laughs> lose the shit thing. laughing when it happens is the like or like almost laughing is the best. His face turns like red is good. It's like the happiest he's been since they've been there. Oh yeah, sex with his wife. <laughs> no, it's not compare to seeing. <laughs> Black Jack Randall get made fun of for his accent and uh, kneeling on the ground and yeah, being berated. It's great. Do you think that Sandringham himself wrote to Jack Randall because he knew it would stir up trouble? Oh yeah. Because Sandringham really, he really seemed to be getting off on the fact that about what he knew about what Randall yeah. did to Jamie. Like he, he's getting off on it. He like living vicariously through him kind of nasty shit. So yeah, yeah. he apps. Oh God. I would be shocked if he didn't. It, at least in some sort of like anonymous way, like, you know, I don't know. I think he probably did it. I'm, I'm sure he mentioned it casually in a letter. Yeah. He, yeah. Cause he's a pretty good manipulator. So he would have done it in a way that couldn't be, um, you know, he can be pinned for it or whatever. And he, he obviously didn't tell him that Jamie and Claire were there. Maybe because he was just excited by the idea that he knew and Jack Randall didn't. I don't know. Well, he loves drama. Yes. Like so he, he, is, he it, loves, yeah. he loves to be sort of the center of attention, but he also likes to be the puppet master a little bit and to kind of like, create these scenarios and then watch them play out like he took that letter from jamie uh you know in in season one probably knowing full well he was never going to do anything but turn it over to jack randall like but he was just like he's like you know what i'm just gonna take this and pretend and uh just give it to jack randall and then see what happens right so he he really loves to like have that role of puppet master and and play with people's lives like that he's still a weenie to be clear (laughs) oh absolutely it's devious but yeah He's, he's a devious weenie but he's still a weenie he told Jamie that Jamie has poor taste in men, and I laughed so inappropriately. Oh my god! <laughs> like I forgot about that. That was the best. <laughs> poor taste in men. Uh, that's not going after our uh, going going after John. That's why he may be a creeper, but his gaydar is strong. Yes, there we go. <laughs> He's such a fucking creep. Ew, I don't like him. But I do like I do like Randall in this season, and you know what? It, I was thinking about this because he appears and like it, it's when you're not expecting to see him, and it'll happen again too. Yeah, like that. That oh god, it was. It's a great transitional shot. Mm-hmm. Um, the way they bring him into it because you like they ratchet up the tension really well. Like I could feel myself getting tense and nervous. Like I know it's coming. I know it's coming, but also kind of excited. Like yay, something's happening. Something's happening. I don't yes, think finally something. Right. I don't think it would have been any less impactful. And this is me going back to our rant from Wentworth into Ransom and Mansoul. It would not have been any less impactful if we hadn't seen all of the violent violation. Like in yeah. real time. 
Just saying. Um, yeah, he was already a, a well-established threat by yes by those episodes by the beginning of uh, Wentworth. I would say you already knew. I mean, we knew before even like yeah, it didn't take we, long. We, we had some idea of what he was capable of, knowing that he you know lashed Jamie. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Two hundred times so it could be as early as that. Yeah. It's like we already knew that he was a sadistic bastard. And there are subtler ways too that I think other media has done better. Um, yes. Uh, anyway, um, we don't need to we don't need to unpack that anymore. But it is a great. He's a he's kind of a he's finally I think like a a, a fun villain almost, and and I say that hesitantly because. What he did was not fun. There are still better ways to show that somebody's evil. Um, but the tension is enjoyable from an entertainment perspective. Yeah, his presence in this season is unexpected. He is way less of a threat than, like, not even close to the threat that he is in season one. Um, you get to see totally different sides of him. He's There's actually, like a lot of vulnerability in both episodes that I can think of that he's, that he's prominently in. And he's almost not used as a villain, like at least in the other episode that I can think of. And he's, he's barely kind of, it's, it's, it's a good move actually, as far as, um, yeah. Yeah. Just giving, just giving him more, just making him more, you know, not re-traumatizing your audience. He's more fleshed out now. I don't even think he's more fleshed out. I just think we're seeing a different side of him because he's had his powers stripped away from him, which is kind of ironic since that's what he was trying to do with Jamie. But, you know, now he's in Paris and he actually, Jamie has way more power than him. Um, But I don't know that he's, I mean, I guess it it does flesh him out more because you get to see what he's like in that position. But, you know, I think it's just, he would not be any less evil for lack of a better word right right during this part if he could be oh for sure you yeah. know like like it's purely his circumstances that are like setting him his footing off and has nothing to do with any sort of humbling or change yeah. or anything yeah no i mean he's still he's still not a, a terribly dynamically written character no, but I think what I what's interesting is he's not out of character. He's just in a different circumstance. I think that's the win. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like once again, just so you don't trauma or even traumatize your audience. Like we don't need to go <laughs> go through that again. Right. Well, and we never see him in that position ever again. Yeah, thank God. Like once the next time we see them, you know, in um, right before Kaladin, you know, he's in a vulnerable position. Yeah. Yeah, and then on the battlefield too, which well, technically we don't see that till season three. But yeah, I just had another thought about, and I'm going back just a little bit to the whole Claire and Frank thing because one of you guys mentioned the sheep knuckles, and do you think that her she, she was already being like weird and selfish about the Frank thing, but do mm-hmm. you think that? hearing that prediction from master Raymond that she would see Frank again has, is what has spurred her further into being like even worse about protecting Frank. Like she's not saying it. And I don't even think in the book that she thinks it, but I feel like maybe that is part of what's spurring her on. Like now she's like, Oh shit. Like, you know, he said that and now I'm starting to think like, I don't, I better like, I better not like, like she wants to keep Frank on the hook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just in case, which is, doesn't make it any better. No. It's, it kind of makes it worse, but um, I just thought of that. So anyway. No, but I think that's, it could be a trigger for sure. It's just like, yeah. how much does she believe in that? But she does trust him. They're like, they're, you know, they're friendly at this point. He's given her things to help her in her like journey in paris and stuff so yeah like yeah because i think it happens mostly before the, the franks yeah like yeah i think it's at least mostly before the frank stuff so it would make sense as to why she's the worst about it uh a, a little bit after that happens so we did mention before when the sheep knuckles thing happened whichever freaking episode that was it's already blended together i've just gotta i've just gotta pull this out so she's 
let's say that this is a solidly probable theory of yours, Beth, that Master Ramon's divination that she put so much fucking stock into is what kind of set this off. But she's so pissed that Jamie has been telling people that she's Ladon Blanche. Because <laughs> Oh my god. Like, yes. <laughs> I'm not a witch, but are you not? Or are you? Pick a struggle, lady. Pick yeah. a fucking struggle. Ugh. Well, I I mean, I I get it. I mean, and she really wasn't that pissed. Like she was kind of like she was oh, a little this a little guy crazy. again. You yeah. know? That was his like Laird dumbass moment of the week, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Like telling people <laughs> that his wife was a witch after she literally almost got burned at the stake not that long ago. But it helped. Is it is it dumb if it works? Yeah, but that wasn't his intention. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, does the Sometimes. end justify the means? <laughs> well, that's the whole thing this episode. Does the end justify the means? No, his intent was to, you know, not get in trouble with his wife by, you know, banging whores at the brothel. So, <laughs> so tells everyone, my wife is a witch and my cock will fall off if I touch another woman. <laughs> Despite the fact that the episode previous, he let... And, and once again, I'm so mad that I couldn't be there for this episode. That, that he let um, a different horror that we never know the name of bite both his thighs. So, like, okay, how long would those massive hickeys take to make? And you're telling me nothing happened? I'm, I can't, I'll never be over this. I'll. If she bit his thighs, something happened. She bit his thighs. That's oh. what happened. You know? Like, I don't care. Probably the moment that I dislike Jamie the most. I'm like, you're lying. You're lying straight to her face, you horny bitch. Like, what is even happening right now? That scene baffles me. I can't even, I can't. And then he's like, oh, I say this thing about you're a witch. You're like, I don't think he's banging horse, but I'm just like, that scene is so ridiculous <laughs> and misplaced. Well, once again, you have a convoluted plot point. Well, so yes. what did she probably write first? She probably wrote the fight <laughs> scene between Jamie and Claire first and then had to go back and write some cockamamie bullshit to get them to the fight that's the only reason i accept because it doesn't make sense <laughs> nothing else about it makes sense and i don't like to think of him cheating because i don't think that's his jam but i like that's those are i can't those are significant hickeys shit was going down. you cannot convince me that shit did not go down were his pants up or down? Because like there was, was no like, way that was so pants. high. No, no, no. They were so right, exactly. By his groin. No, no, no. Yeah, because his butt was out. Like, come on now. Oh no, no. was he, well. He might have been wearing a. Was he wearing a kilt? He doesn't wear a kilt that much. In not Paris, in, in Paris. No. He does to Versailles, but I can't remember. Well, you're like, telling me in... he's wearing a kilt and still stuff didn't happen. Like, yeah, I, I know. I know. I'm not making excuses. I'm just trying to like figure out the chain of events. If someone could explain this to me. Please bring it to the podcast. Come to my Tumblr. Someone explain it to me if you've got the answer to this. It makes me crazy. I have a theory. Jamie is hiding the fact that it's actually Pierre he's sleeping with. <laughs> nice. That's that's the You're one. welcome. That's the one right there. I, I like it. I accept I like it. it. I like it. We're keeping it. He's gonna um, get drunk with John and um, reveal it to him. And, and uh, uh, you can't prove it didn't happen, so it could have. Yeah. And then they'll talk about circumcised versus uncircumcised. Like we have a conversation. <laughs> the best. Um, it's just so funny though, because like right before we just got into that like rambling thing, I which wasn't really rambling, it was a good conversation, but just before we went down that track, I was about to say, like, feel bad for Jamie and be like, Can you imagine how hard it is for him to be in this brothel where these women keep trying to like take away his agency after all that happened? But now I'm like, you know what? Fuck that, because he was he was letting them bite his thighs. So you know what? Forget it. <laughs> Significant bite marks. Laird dumbass. He is living up to that name. Where the shit are we? Well, I think we finished all of our discussion points. On our thing. I have one more. Since I'm apparently really riding this I hate Claire today horse really hard. She continues to confiscate to she continues to confiscate Jamie's agency over her own sense of sentimentality. 
with this argument that they have at the end of the mm. episode over no you can't duel you can't duel him because then frank will won't be born which is just absolute bullshit he knows it's absolute bullshit and what he says to her is really is it's a very mm, real yeah. thing like he can't be like i can't be just a, i can't be a human no i think that's a really poignant moment for jamie because he you know must i bear everyone else's weakness you know and i think that's that line has always stuck with me and there's just a lot of times in life when you know if you're one of those people that does try to take care of everybody you know and then it's like you want this one thing and mm-hmm. you know maybe it's that you want to mm-hmm. duel somebody who a- attacked you and stuff you know that whatever it is maybe you just want to go to a spa for the weekend Wh- whatever mm-hmm. you know like you it's like i do so much and i just need this one thing for me and now you're taking it away from me for some really bullshit reason. And also, what about the fact that, I mean, the reason could have just been, like, I'm pregnant. It's illegal. You need to be here for your baby. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, d- that would have been a perfectly acceptable reason. <laughs> ex- except she, she needed to fill more pages or something, so... <laughs> or she needed to just, like, harp on this, Frank won't be born thing that, that everybody else is like what she continues to put frank over the man she chose to be with her quote-unquote mm-hmm. soulmate exactly. someone make that make sense explain that to me like i'm five how is this I, that's not fucking romance uh, and then she, the way she goes in on him like you owe me a life what the yeah. fuck no no lady yeah, no. that's not how we no. do this because i i hate that and i hate that we just let that sit Ugh. And they, they they just let that sit. And then he lets it go, kind of. Right. Oh. Like it's uh no, he internalized that shit and he made he made a well, yes. well, oh, yeah. If he will address next episode, let me just tell you. But they don't address it. Well, okay. They whatever. Maybe he decides to be mature about it, but he does not give her the shit she deserves for that statement, let me just say. I don't I don't think it was maturity. I think he was just broken down because every time he thinks that he's going to get to make some headway on his own healing journey, his own, like his own recovery, she knocks him back the fuck down over Frank. Well, and all of this, like, uh, well, it's mm, almost like, like have you ever been in an argument with someone and you just get, you kind of just get so angry, but also like you go quiet and then like, you that you know that the stuff that they're saying to you isn't true, but in that moment, because they're saying it louder, it feels true. And then after it's over, you're like, "What the fuck did they just say? Seriously? Like, <laughs> did she really just say that? Yeah, she saved my life twice, and so now I owe her one. <laughs> like, it's you know, it's like the whole thing of like going back later and winning arguments in the shower later. You know, like." <laughs> because like you just freeze and and in his mind he'd already saved hers by the way because remember he thinks that he agreed to let randall right. rape him that's how he that's how he interprets it he thinks he did that it was a choice to him even though we know it was not and so that was already like he'd already saved her life there he saved her life when she was going to be burned at the stake. I mean, so many times. We can make a list. And not over somebody else. He did it for her. Not because anyone told him to. Not not for any other reason than it was for he her. He married her. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That saved her life. But the worst thing that ever happened to him happened to to save her, though. So there is, yeah. So that's kind of a messed up kind of... It's a messed up connection in your head, right? To like To have that... God, do you think he's blaming her at I this think, point? Like, I, this is I your think, fault anyway? Because if you hadn't shown up, I'd have just hanged and been happy with it. It could have been. It, there could be something. Because he's so angry in that moment. Like, he's, I don't think he's ever, and he, no, no, I don't think so. And I don't think he'll ever be as angry as he is at her. Is at, her. at least up until the, and we're at, we, we recently finished season six. So up until then, he's never been this angry. And this is like the most angry that he's ever been at the end. He tells her, do not touch me. Yeah. And when he's kind of negotiating what he's kind of, she's 
uh, when he's kind of um, she's defeated him, you could say. He's like he's pissed about it. He's pissed about it. He's making he's figuring out the terms, and he and he's like re- and he will resent her kind of for it. And he w- and he is um, mm-hmm. yeah like, yeah he knows he was like I want to say manipulated, but it it was he was like co- coerced I guess you could say into this. She didn't convince him. Is basically what I mean. She did not convince him that this was the right choice. No, she just beat him down. When she, he, I remember the first time when he said to her, "Do not touch me." I was like, Oof, "Yeah, oh holy yeah, holy shit!" That hits because so hard. like for Jamie to say that to Claire, like he hasn't said that to her since they were back at the Abbey, which is a totally different circumstance too. Right. Yeah. Right. And he was like out of his mind, you know, but like for him to like not want her touch, I was like, damn, that is, that is, he's pissed. I would also like to point out that at the Abbey, she continued to touch him. Yes. We don't need to go there again. Uh. So once again, she's not a safe space for him. And if we haven't made it obvious, she's taking it, she's pushing it too far. It's very, I don't know, for some yeah. reason that we can barely figure out, it's justified in her head why she's um, asking this of him. To the point, and because I won't be here, I'm just going to say, I hope you have a nice little rant <laughs> next week for the fact that um, she's, that he says to her, oh no, we are even, um, the, I did not. that's not the reason I promised um, I have saved you, and so we're even. She goes, even? And the look on her face, like she doesn't believe they're even. Oh! I know she's pregnant, but I would have bitch left her. I swear to God. And that moment, apparently that scene turns out just fine at the end. But once again, this is a strange moment that is just kind of left hanging in the air. It makes me freaking crazy. Well, and it's, it's almost like she, it's not that she doesn't believe that they're even, but it's almost like she's shocked that he's making the same type of argument, like terrible argument that he, he, she made the day before <laughs> like like how could you try to make turn this into a competition you yeah, know yeah, yeah. <laughs> you open that door lady oh god she's what she's asking of him is not um a marital a normal marital exchange of you do this for me i'll do this for you it's not a no, it's not an appropriate thing to ask your partner in the context that she asks it's a in the context that she asks it of him, it's not appropriate. It's not okay. It's unhealthy. It's toxic. It's selfish. It's not that his choice is great either. It's just that her choice is worse, I think, and the way that she goes about it. it turns him into, you know, this rage machine to the point of kind of he lashes out so greatly that he's, um, you kind of see this uh, twisted part of him still that, that, uh, is so connected once he discovered that jack randall was alive he was elated he felt all this great hope to the point where it may have been the, the only one of the only things kind of keep him keeping him above water so now that she's taking away from him it's like he's connecting his own existence to it and he wants her to kill him if he's not allowed to do this and it's too it's too much it's push it's it's knocking over his trauma bucket in a way that's just not so good well and I'm starting to feel like there's a lot of parallels between this argument and the one they had at the Abbey, because if you remember, she threatened to kill herself. Right. When mm. once again, he, not good. you know, so it's, there's a lot of parallels that I've never thought about before. That's a good point. I'm just going to say this. So, all right, kids, Auntie Pan has been married for a very long time. Um, if your partner is threatening suicide, um, that's not a safe place to be. That's manipulation. That's a that's a very large red flag. Maybe get out. This is not this is not a blueprint <laughs> for a healthy relationship. I'm just yeah, gonna say that. I don't know what uh, number we would be on, but this is another example of Jamie and Claire being in a <laughs> toxic marriage that people should be wary so of um, romanticizing and idealizing in a real life. Um, way feel free to have fun with it in fiction as long as you know that that's what it is yeah so are there some things in this episode other than the lack of plot that just don't make sense that we need to be explained like break it down barney style i don't have it's not they need to be broken down because i think i already made a lot of points like that already but i 
when I started to, to um, just watching this and I thought about the title and again, because the episodes all blend together for me, I sort of didn't realize. So the previous episode is called the Dame Blanche, but it's like, yeah, it's only yeah. said like passing, like in passing, right? Like, he said, we're not in passing, but the guy's like, La Dame Blanche. And then we don't hear anything about it. Mm -hmm. But that episode is titled La Dame Blanche. Makes no sense. And then they just, this is the episode where we find out what that is. It's just weird. I'm like, were they sleeping at the wheel? Sometimes they're taking, you know, chapters from the book. Sometimes they're just feel like they're she just. doesn't do anything witchy last episode. Yeah, it's weird. It's really Did weird. do anything witchy this episode? I don't know. It would have been better if they were switched, though, but I don't know what the Untimely Resurrection would be of last episode. But Well, the Untimely Resurrection, as my understanding, I guess, is referring to Blackjack yeah, right. showing up, but we already knew he was alive. We we been knew that. So this also doesn't make sense. Like, I get, like, recycling the chapter titles, but just because the chat the titles were... chat mm -mm. Just because the chapters were titled, that doesn't make them good titles. Well... And maybe the untimely resurrection, though, isn't that he was not dead, but that he shows up in Paris. That's what I thought, yeah. Because, like, even if he's still alive, I mean, as yeah. long as they can think of him, as long as Claire can think of him as being in England and not being a threat, that's fine. But then he just pops up. It is a strange choice, though. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing that I thought was pointless <laughs> so I'm just really complaining is Claire's little conversation with Annalise. <laughs> like, I don't get what the point of that was. It was filler. It was dumb. Like Annalise is, Annalise yeah. is like, well, he's a man now. And I'm like, okay, like, I think Claire knows that. What the hell? Like, it was just, didn't make sense. I think she was fishing for a threesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you yeah. go. So okay. okay. That was the uh, intention. I'm not mad there. She's hot. I can headcanon that. Like I said, there's a fic. Yeah. At least, there's at least one. There might be more. Because uh, at least some of these other scenes that I could do, I feel like, oh, that's a, that's a good, I'm going to remember that for uh, next episode if there's any see, like scenes between characters that are pointless. Because at least some of the scenes are kind of moments of connection for the characters, but it's like, we don't necessarily need a moment of connection between Annalise and Claire, other than it's fun, no. and they look stunning. But no, you know what the point of that scene was? They look stunning. They're walking through the Versailles, the Versailles Gardens, which the I costumes. which they did film on. So they were probably just trying to make. They're literally just being like, look at look at how much money we spent on this season. Look at the um, look at how much money we spent to rent this place. Look at the costumes that people made. That dress obviously has been photographed. It's kind, it's kind of everywhere. It's one of the dresses from the season that you see everywhere. So I do think it was just a aesthetic. Or it was more so an aesthetic thing. Because it's not even... I think it, that even that scene would have made more sense if it was when... Before Jamie and Claire um, like had reconnected and stuff. Then maybe Claire would have been up under jealousy. They could have like had a discussion about it. More discussion about Annalise or something too. Like Because yeah, otherwise it doesn't. There's no point to it. Well, Claire was never threatened by Annalise. No. And it doesn't serve any purpose to the storytelling to have Annalise have this like moment of revelation that Jamie's a man now and share it with Claire because we don't, she, Annalise never comes into play ever again. Yes. That's, <laughs> yes. It's but like, it, it doesn't make this any is her sense. her one scene in the episode and the last scene she was in was in 202. Like it doesn't. It does yeah. make sense. And then my only other thought is, but I just don't think it's, I don't think people were, because this would be an intelligent choice, but I can't quite make the, make the connection, which is, is she talking to, to her about Jamie in a way that gets her, that makes Randall's appearance more unsettling? Like, does she describe Jamie in a way that makes him seem more vulnerable or something? Talking about mm. it. In a way? But that's so like vague. Yeah, you're right. She she kind of says like he used to be so reckless and headstrong, and Claire's yes. like, well, he still is. But you see, it would be it would make more sense if Jamie were now completely even tempered, and Claire had never known him to be reckless and headstrong. Right. So like, if that were the case, then Claire would be thinking, well, surely Jamie wouldn't do anything like this because he's you know always so calm and steady and whatever. But 
So then it would be like foreshadowing for her and giving her a clue that Jamie is capable of doing this dumbass shit. But she already knows Jamie's capable of doing dumbass shit. So it doesn't make any sense. But now I do want to know how much worse he was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he dueled over a girl that was always going to choose the other guy anyway. <laughs> Like, it wasn't like she was like, you know, I will, whoever wins, I will, you know, marry you. <laughs> She's like, I just liked that guy. <laughs> He's been known to think with his dick. It's fine. It would have been more fun. interesting, though, if she had revealed something to Claire that she didn't know. Which I think is, like, a scandal. And, and like, no one would dare to write that. Because, God forbid, Jamie and Claire don't know each other the best of anybody. But I do think it would have been better. It would have been a uh, would have made it would have given something to that scene and the uh, occurring the events that were about to occur if she had told her something that she that uh, she didn't know before. Yeah. So this is about the point where we would talk about our non canon ship of the week, and I think we have decided that this segment is actually going to be the <laughs> Pan says some wild shit to get canceled and get a reaction out of Beth, <laughs> which. <laughs> This week is gonna be. Um, this week is gonna be a cursed ship. Anyone like to take a guess? What I wrote down is my cursed ship. Not even close. I'm not. I'm nothing. I was fishing for the one that I barely thought of. Is it gonna be like Sandringham and the Bonnie Prince? Oh God! No. Okay, <laughs> that was my guess. I will put that in my pocket. <laughs> that is like definitely a cursed ship. Oh. <laughs> But here's one thing I just want to say for my own enjoyment. Even Sandringham hates Bonnie Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> like the most insufferable man in the world finds, or the second most insufferable man in the world finds the most insufferable man in the world to be insufferable. <laughs> That's the difference, though. That's the difference between Sandringham <laughs> and Charles Stewart. That's the difference. Is that even he's like, oh, God, this guy. I just, that made, that was so satisfying to me. You didn't even talk about your face. I know. I was uh, nice. Well, I was watching him this episode. I was like, oh, you know what? Oh, you know what? Because I was like, no, I'm going to focus on Andrew Grower and like what a good actor he was. And so I did and it helped. Even though I was like, no, you, the, it's the voice, man. The voice is so grating. But I was like, oh, I'm like, I think I had this, I had this crazy. I'm like, oh, no, he's like actually like decent looking. Like I used to think horrible things about him. I'm like, no, no, he's decent looking. He just looks crazy because of the hair and stuff. And, um, oh no, he's actually like, look at this choice and look at this They Again, yeah, I was, appre I was appre weirdly enough, I was appreciating Andrew Gower, not the character who was the worst. Um, but there was not much to say, luckily. He only said Mark B twice again, so. Was it twice? I thought it was once. Well, we will, we'll, next time you're on, we'll, we'll get to talk about him some more. Oh, for Mark sure. me. Sure. We will get to do it. Mark me. I hate you. Mark me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the ship before. Okay. I log out. Okay. <laughs> the cursed ship. Uh, King Louis. Oh. Blackjack. Oh. Okay. I understand. Did you see it? There's yes. a little little, little dummy subby action yes, going the on there. Relation kink. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nope. Don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it either, but I know where her brain went. Suddenly, I could, I could. She said the two things, and I decoded it I really, in the pan, in the pan I, speech. <laughs> I went, "Oh, humili humiliation kink!" Immediately. I, I weirdly like it. I, yes, I, I, I understand where that would go. Absolute filth and debauchery. That's oh, where it would be, go. It'd be, yeah, it'd be Dougal, <laughs> Dougal B. Jericho category in, in those little collection of fix that exist but more uncomfortable it just has to be more uncomfortable it'd be weirder right it'd be weirder would there be a crowd well, Probably. It's like <gasps> weird anyways because they're both freaking rapists well it's, yeah it's just and the, where would it be i mean i guess he's a king he can be wherever he wants and he has power wherever it's good to be the king it's good to be the king <laughs> <laughs> would there be shitting involved oh god this is getting weird okay <laughs> oh keep talking this is great i'm taking notes hold on Shitting oh, public. <laughs> we probably couldn't get worse with. Did you did you, did you say that Dougal BJR, which you thought was your like <laughs> yeah. worst, but this yeah this would give it a run. This might be more cursed. Like, yeah. Oh, I think yeah, I think that actually is weird to think Dougal is tame, but yeah, in this uh, context. Yeah, there we go. 
How you feeling, Beth? <laughs> I'm just sitting here with a puss on my face. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> a little nauseated. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no. Not, not for me. <laughs> I didn't say I was going to write it. I just said it intrigues me. I was going to, I was trying to think of like something clever to say, like you got 99 fix and that shouldn't be one. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't Nano, I would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just not just a couple thousand words, you know, three, four. It'd take a lot I of think, booze, but it'd be fun. Yeah. I think that actually might be the worst curse ship you've ever come up oh, with. Oh, yeah. I think, I mean, well, <laughs> yeah, yes. That are, that are, well, yeah, the pan is going to come up with probably. I'm sure there's other people that are more depraved than pan. <laughs> I hope you, well, I hope you get Levy on here. Oh, t- once you get Levy on here, you will, and you shouldn't tempt, tempt him, but uh, he will scare you. Am I going to need alcohol for that? It's entirely possible. (laughs) Because remember, Lemmy and I have been best friends for like 20 years. Yeah. (laughs) I'm excited for that. I was sad it couldn't happen for 203. I hope it it happens later on. I do too. Um, Really looking forward to that because it'll be an (laughs) absolute blast. I'm so sorry in advance, Beth. (laughs) Yeah. Be prepared. Oh. Hey, we haven't really talked about John too much. Sadly. Should we make some shit up about him? Sure. Um, I have this cute little mental image that he's trying to impress Hector with how good of a swordsman he is. Oh, I can't. He wants to show him how well he wields his sword. (laughs) (laughs) Self flirty. (laughs) But like he's little, so it's like really awkward. (laughs) (laughs) How big is the sword? The sword's like bigger than him. (laughs) Yeah. It's one of those Scottish broadswords. <laughs> that would be a bad. Like, wow, look how strong I am. I'm a big, I, strong man. I just always forget that John is so small in the books. In the books, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. like, David Barry is, like, the perfect John, but he's... He is, yes. But he's so but tall. He's so tall, yeah. Yeah. I was shocked, actually, too, random thought. Uh, shocked actually too to see how tall uh, San Germain was too. I'm like, oh my god, look at all these like, I think they're, what are they, 6'3 or something? Because I think Sam is something like 6'3 or something. So I'm yeah. like, oh my god they have like, that many? Because then Graham too is that tall or just about that He's tall. He's also tall. I'm just like, all these, good for you, Elvander. <laughs> these just like hulking men. But then like, Sam is so tall that he makes them look tiny. Yeah, <laughs> especially if they're so slimmer, like David Barry's a bit slimmer than him. But he's Almost as tall, or like he's got to be six one or six two. I think so. he's six one. Yeah, yeah six one. And, and I just looked up too because Rick Rankin, he he to me, like I'm Wasn't like he's shorter. Oh, yeah, I'm like oh he's small, but it says right here he's six foot. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely think he's like five ten. <laughs> okay, but this mm-hmm. one's okay. Well, this says five eleven and a half. So who knows? Right. Depending on what website you're you're looking at oh he's younger than me by a few years oh i feel old really he's 39 isn't that weird when you like the i recently had that thing where i noticed oh yeah because interview with a vampire my new love um sam reed is exactly my age and i was like oh i could i could not believe it could not believe it he looks so mature it's like this seismic shift at some point where like instead of always assuming that that actors are older than you all of a sudden they're like all younger than you and you're like oh this is not how it's supposed to be <laughs> yeah yeah me and me and ness are kind of on the cusp of that yes exactly yeah. the same yeah. Age. We're the same, yeah exactly i've already gone over that uh that edge and let me tell you it's it's, it's not a, necessarily barely. it's not necessarily a fun place to be um yeah. barreling right along um Anybody add fix to their dead on arrival list this week? No, I'm been, I'm feeling so boring with this, and this was my idea, but no, I didn't. It was your idea, <laughs> but it gives me an outlet because yeah, I'm go. not adding shit. <laughs> I'm not putting anything in Scrivener, therefore I can just say it and get it off my chest, and then it's fine, and I feel better about it. Um, I had oh, I've kind of forgotten some of the details, but it's kind of a 
either like a modern AU or like Jamie goes to the future, the future comes to Jamie kind of thing. And he discovers like thirst traps on TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There is a fic where he goes into the future and discovers TikTok, but I don't (laughs) remember if he actually does thirst traps. He's just kind of more like adorably dorky about it. Well, not like, not him doing thirst traps, him watching thirst traps. So (laughs) where this... (laughs) Like the like the wood chopping guys. <gasps> yes, exactly oh, him. <laughs> exactly the wood chopping guy. <laughs> it could be a modern AU, and he could be. That could be how he meets John because John oh, is being one of those wood chopping guys. Cannot. And Jamie's I... like, "Oh God, my whole life just changed." But can, Shit. John, but can John be Australian? I want <laughs> an Australian wood chopper because I want to fic where john is australian but i don't want to write an australian accent you are so obsessed with australians right now <laughs> well and it's not even because of sam reed but uh no because i had this thought for a stripper you that i want to um write but i was like oh no but i can't i can't i cannot give myself to an australian accent i'm already too consumed by the scotch one so but i want i want it though he does chop wood on a place to call oh what yeah he it? does a place to go home yeah. Yeah, there you go Ta-da. And then mine, I yeah, I couldn't think of one. I was trying to be prepared and prepare for this episode for most of the day, and I couldn't think of one. I was amazed. I thought I had at least a few, but I've apparently forgot them all already. But I, but actually, watching this episode kind of inspired me. That I, I wish I could write a good um, horse, Jamie. Um, probably AU. Yeah, no, most yeah, most likely AU. And I'm like, and I was like, oh, wait, it happened again. End of sentence. Like, what else would that even be? I don't know. I just know I want it to be a good uh, horse Jamie uh, story where it's. Uh, um, I'm because, um, you know, some of the shit I've written for cursed trouble prompts. I'm going to need you to oh clarify God. what punctuation <laughs> is, oh God, which is so funny, because in thinking about this, I went there and this time I totally forgot about it until you said it. Um, <laughs> yes. So not. Jamie slash horse no but more like (laughs) horse girl Jamie if you know this horse girl have you heard of horse girl yes okay I know what you're saying horse girl Jamie Jamie. (laughs) (laughs) Uh Um, did I send you that prompt too I can't remember but um so my own yeah so kind of my only thought was maybe oh maybe it'd be fun and funnily enough I never kind of think this way because David Barry is my John I don't like to think of him any other way but I like kind of little blonde jockey John for this story. I was like, well, that's kind of fun yeah. and different. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not a researcher, unlike Pan here. So I will not research this um, sport, even though I do love a sports AU. Bring on the sports AUs. But um, no, I won't be going into this. But I was like, oh, that'd be fun. That's, just, that's, that's something. And then these are things, too. It's like, this is something that I would want to read that I'd be interested in reading. So, Horse girl, Jamie. Horse girl, Jamie. <laughs> love it. How about a fic rec for the week? Yeah, so um, Ness was trying to come up with something and was having a bit of a difficult time. And I suddenly remembered one. So I'm going to do it instead of Ness. So the fic fic rec this week is Les Les Suppliantes. And it's a fic that's set in Paris. And... The premise is a little convoluted, like <laughs> like this episode. Kind of. So it's like, it, well, I'll just read the summary. So in her continued efforts to heal Jamie spiritually and sexually after his brutal treatment at Wentworth Prison, Claire decides she will submit to him completely while they rebuild their lives in Paris. She allows him to inflict some pain and a lot of pleasure while he reasserts his he reasserts his confidence as a man, a husband, and lover. So I don't necessarily like the premise seems a little weird but it's like basically means that it's you know a bdsm fic and it's got some pretty hot stuff in it so please read the um tags Um, they're detailed yeah yes um enjoy it for what it is uh because it's pretty enjoyable it's by a fic writer named uh called kitty perpetua and she only wrote a few fix for the fandom. Well, only three. One of them I've never read, but her other one too, A Stranger Visits, 
is so good. And I'm probably going to recommend it in sometime during season three. So I won't go into it, but that one and this, uh, this list of Leon is they're really good. So. Well, we did get uh mail this week. I yeah. We got That's a message good. sent in from WordPress. So thank Thank you, JPK. The message says, wanted to say thank you for the podcast. It's pushed me through many painful hours at the gym. It's nice to find an, find other fans who adore Lord John as much as I. This oh, message is to address the Eaton question that came up. Ah. It's possible that it's possible that Lord John might have attended as a boy for a year or two before his father's death. It's definitely a possibility that his father and brother attended. That said, my first thought was that William attended Eaton because that's where the Ellesmere men were schooled. And he's following in his legal legal father's family tradition. Again, thanks for both the laughs and the thoughtful discussions. JPK. Thank you, JPK. I think I had that thought too. Um, yeah. In passing. But that doesn't make a lot of sense. We really appreciate you writing to us. We're just, Thank you. you know, waiting for like sitting here. Refresh, refresh. No, just kidding. But <laughs> doing the uh, corrections work for you too. There you go. I'm glad that we can make your painful hours at the gym a little bit better. I mean, cause that's really what this podcast is for is to, is making like pretty painful things marginally better, you know, cleaning toilets, sitting in traffic on your way to work or on your way home from work, you know, or both because we don't shut up, <laughs> yeah, <there> we go. <laughs> you know, um, working out at the gym when you just want to be on your couch eating potato chips. So, um, you know, save the, save the, uh, fun shows and stuff for the, when you're on eating potato chips and let us get you through the worst of it. <laughs> <laughs> Love that we get to come along with you guys for an, uh, you know, a while every week. <laughs> no longer it's- unspecified amount of time. No. Yeah. We're done. The, the 30 minute gag was, I was like, I think we just need to drop that. <laughs> we ran that into the ground. Anyway, um, anything that we miss? Anything burning, Ness, Beth, that you guys just got to get out? Shockingly, no. Yeah. yeah like <laughs> sad Paris episodes that you just feel like you're scrambling. I'm so ready to get to like the, the famine. <laughs> Scotland is is better. It, at least for watching this too is reminding me about how much um, the second half, or like this, uh, sadly, the smaller second half of season two is <laughs> is is something. It gives us something. I can't wait for the horrible war where they're trudging through and starving to death <laughs> and freezing. <laughs> the PTSD and the trauma. Lovable characters dying all over the place. Gives you something to look forward to. We only got two more of this shit. Just two more. We can get through it. God bless. Good luck next week. Brace yourselves. It will not be fun. <laughs> I'm excited to listen to it in a few weeks. I'm sorry, I guess, I want to say. It's because I feel bad that you're going to go through it. But um, please compare it <laughs> to... I'm, this, is my, this is my request for next week. Please compare it to 203. Figure out which one is uh, more or less boring. Which one was harder to get through. Um, that'd be fun. Well, I fell asleep during 203. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll be a good gauge for that. So love it. Love it. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. 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 If you're listening to this, it means you survived another episode of Lord John Lander. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter or Tumblr at Lord John Lander or on our website at lordjohnlander.wordpress.com slash contact us. All opinions expressed on the Lord John Lander podcast belong to us and are not affiliated with Outlander, Sony, Stars, and definitely 100% not with Diana Gabaldon. This podcast is not suitable for children, immature adults, homophobes, anyone who takes fandom seriously, people who don't understand that the characters aren't real, people with sticks up their ass, people who hate fun, and people with no sense of humor. Do not try any of these hot takes at home. We are professionals. And if you know us in real life, no you don't.